large aggregation of hyphae. This mycelium was 34 acres large. It weighed about what a blue whale weighs, and it was about 1,500 years old. And it was all, as far as the DNA testing went, it was all the same organism, the same thing. So it gives you a sense. And then, of course, a couple years later, they came up with one that was 2,200 acres in Oregon or something like that. And there's always, always somebody out there who's waiting to top your number. But uh, the mycelium is the powerful fungus. The um, mushroom is the little blessed event that we can benefit from, uh, that we can enjoy, as far as that goes. Oh, so are you see. saying like like this, the cell right here is exactly the same as the cell? Mm -hmm. They're all mm -hmm. exactly the same. Yeah, they're just packed in in different ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a question for you mm -hmm. about harvesting the mushrooms. Mm -hmm. um, if I've heard from very people, you shouldn't, like when you harvest you shouldn't pull the whole thing up, you should cut it at the base mm -hmm. because it would affect um, its reproductive capacities in the future. The mycelium? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What so, else so I guess what, and I've, and I've also heard that it's okay just to pull them up, but so I'm wondering from your point of view, would you recommend like cutting them or pulling right. them? Does it well, matter? There's two different things. To answer the, the issue that's being addressed and what you're asking, I, myceliums, mycelia, are huge, that are major things. Even if a mycelial mat is only as big as a bath mat, this little uh, you know, event of harvesting a mushroom is not damaging the mycelium in any significant way. People who live in California and other highly populous areas uh, do not feel that way. Now, I'm speaking as a resident of a small state where we don't have, you know, hordes of people tromping through the woods and just ripping up all the mycelium and that kind of thing. People who live in those places are really concerned about that as an issue. They see, you know, people go through the woods and just rip up and really, you know, work the substrate over. Uh, and they talk about the delicate mycelium and that kind of thing. I'm not so sure how delicate a mycelium is. My sense of fungi is that they are un incredibly robust. And as I said, they go where they want to and they do what they want to. But I can see the point. Nobody wants people tripping through their woods, ripping things up. That is an issue apart from the issue of how to harvest a mushroom. If you are harvesting a mushroom for um, identification and you don't know what it is and you want to know what it is, it's very, very important to get it right down to that I'll use one. Thank you very much. To get it right down to the base and a little bit of whatever's happening under the base, just to be certain. Because, for instance, this guy here, who is our sickener, our local sickener, you're all probably familiar with Ammonitum muscaria or the devil's, uh, devil's mantle, people call it. And that guy's got um, a cup at the base called a vulva that it grew out of, and uh, if you don't harvest that vulva as well as the stem, you could start to be in trouble about identifying it correctly because sometimes these warts come off when the thing is growing from deep underground or the rain washes them off. Sometimes that annulus, that skirt that's hanging there, is uh, washed off by rain or just you know, because it happened to be a flimsy annulus. And pretty soon you've got a mushroom. If you don't harvest the whole thing, you may well have a mushroom that's not as easy to identify as you thought and could lead to culinary errors of one sort or another. So if you're identifying a mushroom, you need to get all the way down to the base. If, on the other hand, you know that this is an orange delicious and you've eaten them before and you pinch the stem and you don't think it's wormy, so you're in luck right there. You got there before the worms did. It's perfectly okay, and in fact, it will keep your collections cleaner uh, to uh, shave it off at ground level or someplace where you're not going to be putting all that mud. See, it's hollow, so that one's in it. But where you're not going to be putting all that mud into your collecting basket. So uh, if you don't do that, the other thing you might want to do is, to the extent that you still come up with mud on your mushroom, field dress it right out there. And uh, if, you know, it really helps to return the field members and just throw them off the trail, as my, my teacher always said. And uh, 
you're home free. If you know what the mushroom is, then that becomes something that we can be very conscious, conscientious about. It's shaking them off the ground level and leaving the mycelium. But if you want to identify a mushroom, you're, you're not going to be picking 30 or 40 of them anyway. You're going to want to bring a nice array of specimens back. Ideally, you would get a child, an adult, and a teenager. That would be the ideal way because an elderly mushroom is very, very difficult to identify correctly. I just, there are two things I say. I have 90% of the mushrooms that people show me and they say, what is this? I have to say, it's too old, I can't tell. Or, I, you know, I can't honestly say what it is. Or the other excuse that I give for not knowing everything in the world is it's an LBM. An LBM is a little brown mushroom. There's about a thousand of them. I could spend the rest of my life becoming an expert in boring little LBMs. And as a hobbyist, my goal is to have some fun with and know the big guys, the high profile guys, the celebrities, and the interesting ones, you know, the brainy intellectual ones and all of that, the ones that have little stories to tell you. So I really don't get as deeply into the LBMs as uh, somebody else might. They're just not of that great interest to me. So that's a good question. And I hope anybody will interrupt me. I'd love to be interrupted at any time that you've got any kinds of questions. Yeah, I've heard this with harvesting down in BC in the Oregon area that, you know, the harvesting techniques with breaks and, and shovel does destroy, you know, the, the, yeah. the ability of the mushroom to come back. That's right. If you're a single mushroomer out there in the woods, don't feel badly about pulling out the whole mycelial, you know, the whole mycelial uh, foundation from which the thing arose. If you're a raking commercial mushroom <laughs> picker, then that's a different yeah. story entirely. Yeah. <laughs> and that does ruin the habitat for everybody. But, yeah. Do you know when the um, mushrooms appear in the fossil record? I could look it up for you because I know I've got it in the file somewhere. <laughs> in my mixed up files, that there's been something recently about that too. Oh. I do know. Yeah, go ahead. When you say go, like going up to the fifth floor of the building and so on, uh -huh. they're not going, they're just being taken. I mean, exactly, they, they're they rising, no, they, no they do not have oh, any God. form of <laughs> motility at all. Yeah, yeah. There, well, there are fungi that have motility, they have little flagella, and they, you know, oh. those are the ones in the water, and they swim around, oh. and you can bait them to come to you. Uh, no, those are spores that just, you know, those are spores that just grows on wind currents. Yeah, yeah trickly, absolutely. Uh -huh. Right, right. Never wind, yeah. the air in the building is <laughs> tenderized anyway because it's being heated from somewhere. So, yes, good question. Um, and that makes me want to make another point. Fungi are actually more closely related to animals than to plants. We all, I didn't start off this way, I usually do. Fungi are neither plants nor animals. They have a kingdom of their own. And they are actually more closely related to animals than plants by about a billion years. The, uh, in the you know growth from a single-celled universal ancestor, the plants and the animal fungi lines split off about a billion years before the animal and the fungi divisions separated and there's a couple of things that you can remember that that help you to you know envision this one is that plants of course are autotrophic they can create their own food from sun and through using you know carbon uh, chlorophyll and all that we and the fungi are both heterotrophic we must eat other things our strategy for eating things, for gaining nutrition, is to ingest. Their strategy is to exude exoenzymes from the tip of a hypha. All those growing hyphal tips are exuding exoenzymes, and think of it as fungal spit. They spit out there, the spit digests the food, and then they reabsorb it through the cell wall. So that is how they nourish themselves. Um, and that, uh, you know, they, they need to eat other things, in other words, and that's how they do it, just as we have a little different strategy that we need to. Another indication that they are more closely related to animals is the fact that this fungal cell wall is made of chitin. 
Oh. Not cellulose. And chitin is the stuff of insect coverings and shrimp shells. Arthropods. That kind of thing. Exactly. And it's very indigestible to us, which is why somebody like David Aurora in his very amusing book will tell you that a lot of people who think they've got mushroom poisoning have really just eaten too many mushrooms. <laughs> He's eaten too many mushrooms. He's put a huge load of chitin on his, in his intestines, and he just isn't managing to digest them. Wow. So there is that to be considered. You really can't pig out on mushrooms. I remember when I was a young single householder, you know, with my own apartment for the first time. I thought, now I can eat anything I want. I don't have to eat other people's menus. And I went out and I bought a pound of mushrooms, which had always been my favorite food in the whole wide world. And I felt terrible, just terrible. You can't eat that many mushrooms. I think of mushrooms as uh, not a, a condiment, really, but a garnish. Um, oh. Yeah, you don't want to eat a half pound of mushrooms or a pound of mushrooms. You really put a chitin load on your system. It's just terrible. And you could get an intestinal blockage. Like you don't want to eat that many beetles either. No, that's exactly <laughs> right, because it's going to go through you just like a beetle would. Mm-hmm. Sounds like a man with experience. <laughs> Those creatures across the bay, I was on a nature trip uh, last month and called chitons. Yeah, uh-huh. it's spelled differently. Oh. And I've never looked at the, uh, at the. Uh, there's probably an etymological similarity there. You know, there's only one. Chiton is O-N, and chitin, the substance, is I-N. Have I got it right? Yeah. Lee's going to tell me. She'll tell me later if I'm wrong. You're right. Um, <laughs> but in any event, uh, I suspect it has something to do with the Greek word shield. Okay, isn't that awful for me to stand up here and make a guess like that? No, no. I'll bet you, you know, I'll bet you that there's some sense of, you know, of uh, plaqueness to the similarity of the two world words. A chitin is a funky little thing that sits on the, yeah, shell up, glommed mm-hmm. onto a rock or something like that. And chitin is a defense for bugs, shrimps, and all of that. So we'll see. Somebody will look it up and let me know if I'm wrong. Um, Okay, so that's the background. That's what we're talking about, about fungi. And you need to move then to more practical matters, which is about how you get out there and find out what's interesting and fun either to look at or, more interestingly yet, to eat. And if you join a mushroom club, the first thing you do is you find yourself a basket. (laughs) Everybody who's ever belonged to a mushroom club has a basket. And it's so that it doesn't fall over and dump out your collections for one good reason. And it's really good for carrying things like your field guide. Now, if you can only have one book, I would recommend getting this one. It's overkill for a lot of people. They probably won't get this far into mushrooms. I know an MD who's trying to study mushrooms, and she said after a couple of years, I'm still trying to find a way into that book. (laughs) It is really, it's got a total of like 2,000 mushrooms in it. It is very amusingly written. This guy, he's the same person who did the posters. Yeah. He's just made a career of of being funny and fun and enjoying mushrooms tremendously. So this may be the way to go if you can only have one book. Diane, is his smaller book still in print, the one called All the Rain Promises? Yes, it is. Uh It's It's still in print. It's smaller and lighter. He has a smaller one called All... This is called Mushrooms Demystified. His smaller book is called... All of the rain promises. And more. And more. And it fits in more. It's more suitable for the field. But the problem with mushrooms, again, is that you're hoping maybe that you'll be able to distinguish between some 2,000 of them. And if you take small books out in the field with you, uh, there's a very high likelihood you're not going to find what you've discovered on the ground in the book. Nonetheless, the small books are a very good way to supplement, they're a way to aggregate all of your information because every field guide has something, a different choice. Every every author had different things that he wanted to put in. 
convention and all the rain promises and more. I have a lot of pictures from his Alaskan trip. You recognize places a lot of Sterling Highway and so on. So it does have a good touch of Alaska in it. You may even recognize people. <laughs> oh, you may. This is a wonderful, it's got, I think, about 50 mushrooms in it. Uh, 34. 34. Okay. <laughs> they are, yeah, they were carefully selected to represent the ones that you will be most likely to see in Alaska and go, oh, wow. I gotta know what that yeah, is. Yeah, we should also mention that Neil took most of the photos for this book. Or we he just shot them. all of them? Most of them, not we all should. of them. We should. Yeah. Oh, There's a. This will make your mouth water. The picture of the porcini on the back, the King Belief. It's absolutely mm -hmm. gorgeous. Phyllis Kempton told me they didn't have any with big bulbs up on them in Alaska. Uh -huh. And I don't know if I ever got a picture to her. We had one of, uh -huh. of Colin when he was a little guy holding one in each hand like yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> they, uh, no, they have the big bulbs up here. This is a very nice little book. Unfortunately, it's out of print because of the, or it's hard to get because of the publisher's consultants at the moment. Um, there may be, in fact, bookstores that still have copies. If you find one, I would recommend getting one. Um, but anyway, so you take a basket and a field guide with you, and you take little paper bags because mushrooms don't like plastic. You see people out collecting mushrooms with plastic, and I say if you found a big group of edibles and all you've got is plastic, go ahead and go for it. But if you can line it with paper towels or newspaper or something like that, better yet. And best of all is having uh, paper bags or better yet, these are cookie bags from Sagaya in uh, Anchorage, which I don't think they carry anymore. The best thing of all is wax paper because it has the least tendency to stick to the mushroom surfaces and... Uh, and, you know, you come home at the end of the day, you don't want to be peeling your mushrooms out of something and leaving portions of them behind. Um, you want to take some kind of little hand lens or magnifier just for fun because the gill attachment and various qualities about the mushroom might be interesting to you if you really get into it. I take this when I go on walks because I hate to harvest a mushroom if we've already looked at it. And yet you cannot tell from the top always what a mushroom is. So if somebody says, oh, what's that? And it doesn't look like the Russula aeruginea that we just studied. But if I go underneath it like that, I can see that it's got gills and it's not anything else. Then I just leave it there for someone else to, uh, to enjoy. You take bug spray. You take water. And um, then you're off into the woods. You take a knife. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, somebody had a cool little wrist thing for his knife. That was great. I just keep putting mine back in my pocket. One of the things that you need to do if you want to identify a mushroom is to take spore prints. And these are some that I have taken. You'll see I'm not even sure. I didn't even stop to verify exactly what mushrooms those were. Um, but just, you know, so, so that you get an idea of what a spore print looks like because I never seem to get to these events early enough to set up a spore print on the scene. There's Diane, let me ask you a question on that. When you